Greetings everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in TNO in which we're playing as the greatest nation on the earth, the United States of America. So, if you'd like to read about the United States and its current predicament in January 1st, 1962, please go right ahead. And here's the next paragraph. Follow up with the next paragraph. So, the mods we're using obviously are TNO, the last days of Europe. We're using the player of the peace conferences as well as the state transfer tool mod. So, I've already decided for this campaign that we're gonna go down a certain path and I really want to get a certain type of uh, person in power, I'll put it like that a very certain type of <clears throat> southern person in power, anyways so it's 1962 we're halfway through Nixon's presidency and I would really love to play someday Nixon starting in 1960 because I would love to see keep it clean reestablish a party investigate some corruption reassure Dixiecrats so right now we gotta wait to, ha to do the they have a dream focus so in the meantime, how about we go to cracking the steel curtain? Why not? In the war's aftermath, Germania drew a line hugging the stretch of Europe's coast between the Norway's fjords and the Strait of Gibraltar. Along its length rose a string of watchtower seawalls and concertina wire. Their seams held together by trillions of rocks marks and the dude's Aryan will. This string will hold over the old world goes by deceptive names like the Einheit's Pact and Fortress Europa. The free world calls it for what it is, a steel curtain. The Volkshalle would... Have one believe that the steel curtain is as the Gibraltar Dam. Impregnable. Insurmountable. Everlasting. In truth, the curtain is pregnant with rot. Surmounted by power struggles and frail on its deathbed. Much like its architect, Mr. Daddy, over there. Subtle blows can make gaps out of its rustiest sections. There's Liberty's torchlight, which can filter back into the continent afresh. Very cool. And, uh, crack oh yeah, and we have the whole Senate mechanic. Yeah. So... I'm not too concerned about that. Let's see. Liberal democracy, not bad. Conservative democracy. We have... Oh! Oh, look at that! Mr. Wallace down there. Oh. That's Mr. Wallace. Okay, cool. The end of the missile crisis. For the past several weeks, the U.S. has been embroiled in a crisis with the Japanese. Our former jewel in the Pacific, Hawaii, has been turned into a staging point for Japanese medium-range ballistic missiles, which was discovered by CIA U-2C spy plane not so long ago. After a tense standoff between the United States Navy, First Fleet, and the IJM, Vice President Kennedy approached the Empire with an offer. The U.S. would remove its own MRBMs from Australia in return for the Japanese doing the same in Hawaii. After several rounds of intense negotiations, the offer was accepted, despite the urging of the Joint Chiefs, who argued it was a perfect time to reclaim America's lost territory. The Dove, the Doves prevailed, and today both sides are removing our missiles. This has been a major diplomatic coup for Kennedy, who is being hailed across the nation as a hero for his actions in the crisis. President Nixon, on the other hand, mostly stayed out of the negotiations and has been widely criticized for such. We stayed off midnight for now. Cool. Uh, something else I was going to say, I can't remember right now, but let's see. Uh, schooling, slowly going up. So research facilities, agriculture, poverty rate... Modern industrial or you know industrial equipment, uh, industrial expertise as well as army professionalism, but casting off with a compass in hand and butterflies in stomach, he gazed off towards the vistage of Anchorage, rapidly shrinking away into the horizon. A game of cards and a hearty serving of alcohol had certainly done wonders to feed its excitement and wanderlust while they were docked in port. But he had to admit it; it was hard to get to yesterday's goodbyes out of his mind. His mother's reaction had not surprised him. A quiet bout of sobbing and a laundry list of demands as they stood before the front door. She had been nervous for weeks, and on all that time, he had done his best to reassure her. This was something he needed to do. He would take all available precautions. He would have all the necessary documents. It was a conversation that seemed to never end. No, he had resolved any lingering strife with Mom. It wasn't her that was spotting such remorse in his sea-bound heart. Surprisingly, it was Dad. To say his father was an enigma would be an understatement. Childhood memories existed beyond count. Missed baseball games, absent birthday parties, one-word responses to kindergarten art pieces. It was not that Dad didn't care at all, per se. From time to time, he would show his affection, teach his sons to replace a flat tire or two. The problem was consistency, or the lack thereof. At any moment, Dad might disappear into the basement again, or Car would pull out of the driveway and return home hours after family dinner had ended. He never knew what to make of it. Perhaps the war had simply taken too large a toil, or toll, created a man who could only function on whiskey and at lonesome hours. So when Dad burst into tears in front of the taxi, launched into a bear hog, and handed his son a compass, and pistol subtly before the car door closed, he couldn't help but feel shaken. Was he really going to make the right decision? If he could if it could affect a man such as that, that so greatly. Ultimately, he brushed the thought away and returned below deck. There's no turning back now, and a giant and great adventure laid out before him. He would return alive and ultimately change for the better. 
Time to find out what's really out there. German moon landing to Germany today proudly announced to the world that a German was the first to ever step on the moon. Eberhard Kölner, using a rocket based on the A9 slash A10 design from World War II, and as a member of the team led by acclaimed scientist Werner von Braun, successfully landed along the team predominantly made up of former Luftwaffe pilots. Kölner, on live TV broadcast globally, snapped a smart salute to the flag of the Reich with the Earth visible in the backdrop, a photo which has spread across the globe, thanks in no small part to German propaganda. Jubilant celebrations began almost immediately across Germany. Already, President Nixon has publicly vowed that the race shall continue, and that NASA is already making preparations for a permanent human presence upon the moon, in the form of a lunar colony. The President's announcement was quickly followed by one from Japan, who stated that they will land on Mars. Despite the President's insistence that the race is not over, the American public has taken the news poorly. Although America managed to get the first astronaut into space, public confidence in the space program is at an all-time low, as fewer Americans than ever look to the night sky with a sense of explorative awe. We begrudgingly congratulate Mr. Kolner. Oh, hell, Kolner. So, after that, we should do Forgotten Allies, uh, helping out a friend, First on Domino, hmm. Look into the Reformer. We'll probably do that. Let's go with South African plan after this. South Africa is one of the last true democratic strongholds left in Africa who are not fully opposed or working with us. Yet, the presence of the Nazi scum north of them makes their existence and our chance to make use of such an African foothold possibly very short. To combat this, a plan has been drawn up to slowly draw the U.S. and South Africa together in order to protect their democracy and weaken the grip of German fascism in Africa as a whole. Stellar dreams. He soared into the rocket ship above the Earth as he gazed through the capsule window. As the continent stretched up beneath him, he realized just how small mankind truly was. It occurred to him that if every human being had the opportunity to see what he could see, how insignificant all the struggles and wars and vendettas were, the world might finally know peace. A peace where everyone could work towards the advancement of science, prosperity, and... A sudden ringing cut across his psyche, and he was jolted from a, day, a dream of days past, sitting sluggishly awake from a sadly earthbound bed. He fumbled for the telephone in his bedside cabinet and pulled the receiver to his ear. John Glenn speaking, way too early in the morning, might I add. A panicked voice came across the line. John, it's James. Have you heard the news? Glenn rubbed the sleep out of his eyes and replied, James Edwin Webb, I've not even gotten out of bed yet. Be more specific, they're defunding NASA. A hastily made coffee and frantic slip through the morning paper later, and John Glenn felt a wrench in his gut as he faced the prospect of his life worth being off or not. So what, the Germans have got to the moon first, and that just means space is over? What can we do? They just can't give up on the future. Nixon's already made up his mind. He wants to move the money over to the military and other practical projects. Webb paused as Glenn made an outraged intake of breath. I really don't think there's anything we can stop him at this point. I'm sorry, John. Glenn could feel back in his rivery of spaceflight. Or felt himself back into it. The government could not let the dream of space but be a dream. America had to live to see the stars. Nothing can we can nothing we can do. We'll see about that. Some men still dream. Assassin strikes a Mr. Hitler. News from Germany today is sporadic at best. CIA assets in Germany have reported that shortly after celebrations over the moon, landing began to settle. German military units and several platoons worth of the German dictator's various bodyguard units filled the streets and immediately put the city under martial law. From what we are hearing, an assassin, which the Germans claim had belonged to the Japanese Ken Pai Tai, attempted to kill the Fuhrer, but was stopped in his attempt by one of Hitler's personal bodyguards and was killed on the spot. Already reports of several assassinations have surfaced, as various politicians of the Reichstag initially believed Hitler to have been killed and long planned plots to eliminate the rivals in the chaos. In the streets, the various military units nearly came to blows as various units ordered one other to stand down and chain of command broke down. While the situations began to recover, martial law is still in effect in Germania, and suddenly, the Reich seems much weaker. In Washington, this raises the question, how can the Germans maintain the new world order where they can hardly handle themselves? As one eagle falls, another one rises. Great. Great, great, great. A class three election senate season the u.s is once again gearing up for election season as per the constitution all the seats in the house of representatives and a third of the senate seats will be up grabbed in november along with innumerable state and local races across the nation and the course of american politics will change with it Status quo, radical people, it's time for the people to decide. The Republican Democrats and the National Progressive Party, along with numerous third parties, are gearing up for the political machines across the 50 states. With special focus going on to those Senate seats up for grabs, tens of thousands of volunteers, campaign staff, and volunteers and candidates are gearing up to begin the primaries, rallies, whistle stop tours, public speeches, glad handing, and debates that will dominate the nation's attention for the next few months. Issues of great importance will be debated, candidates will be scrutinized, and eventually millions of voters around the nation will get their chance to make their voices heard. And the greatest democracy in the world will once again prove itself. Do we want to go with keep America strong and free, vote R&D, or do we fight for you and me, help me elect the NPP? Well, let's just say, because I want to pass the Civil Rights Act, <clears throat> 
I like to call a little NPP, but protests in Birmingham. The civil rights movement is reaching its crescendo. All across America, there are protests, rallies, and riots hosted by the civil rights activists. And they get worse by the month. Just this week, a massive march was held in Birmingham, Alabama, the heart of the segregation itself, with tens of thousands of activists, white and black alike, calling for equal rights. Although it started civil, local police chief Eugene Bull Connor quickly deployed riot police and set dogs loose on the protesters. The peaceful march quickly turned into a running battle in the streets between police and activists. This event has been widely televised across the nation, with average Americans shocked by the police brutality on display in Birmingham. Many of the more liberal news sources across the U.S. have likened the events in Alabama to those in Germany decades ago, citing police brutality and the suppression of activists to draw parallels with Nazi regimes, whirring, and one flew over the cuckoo's nest. From the sun-drenched hills, revanche-laden neighborhoods, and un wild underground economies of the Bay Area comes the debut novel of one Ken Kesey. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. It's bizarre, profane, provocative, and a gauntlet thrown under the table of American literature. Inspired by Kesey's work as a psychiatric orderly in Menlo Park, California, the novel follows one Randall McMurphy. He, a veteran of Scotland and proud street brawler, is sentenced to time in a psychiatric hospital for battery and illicit gambling. There, he meets a number of psych characters, including the novel's narrator, Chief Bromden, the tyrannical head nurse, Chief Ratchet. Over the course of the novel, McMurphy challenges Ratchet's rule, standing up for himself and the other patients in the ward. He is rewarded for this with a bloody lobotomy, courtesy of Ratchet. Uh, the novel ends with Bromden smothering McMurphy in an act of mercy before escaping to freedom cuckoo's nest. His ordering garnered its fair share of accolades and controversy alike, many are calling it a portrayal of America's own authoritarian systems in an age where the nation is supposedly a bastion of liberty in the world. Hollywood, st Hollywood star Kirk Douglas has already been seeking adaptation rights, while schools across America are rumored to be banning it. I'm so crazy, I plan to vote for Eisenhower again this November. That'd be actually really cool if we could. Allison Wilcox, Jane Andrews, eh, Allison, just because... We can. Oh, and we need to. Oh, hey. Oh, Adrish. Oh. Oh yeah, we can also recruit. Let's go and recruit some dude. Uh, I'll read this once, and after this, we won't read it again. So, a new cohort of recruits have begun training at the CIA's facilities. Of the individuals selected to undergo training, a few, perhaps only one, will display the right combination of fortitude, subtly, uh, uh, subtlety, and intellectual rigor to take up the mantle of freedom and its hidden struggles worldwide. The CIA will require that some resources be diverted to a training program until they conclude, which may delay the implementation of operations elsewhere. Understood. Uh, pick research, pitching cameras, uh, I don't really care. Oh, pop, PP growth? Uh, I don't think we can grab any of this. We need more expertise, so. Budget? Hmm, I love the alphabet boys. There you go, you can have as much money as you want. Five, half a billion? Seems pretty good. Cool, and we did want to go with, ooh, there's five center, eight far right. Increase unity. Well, we probably don't need to release this for now, so. And what do you want to campaign? I'm not sure, like, when I, okay, I've played this before as, I went down the RFK route and the Glenn route, so, when that happened, I, it said, like, people recommended that I don't choose an option, just so that the other opposition could campaign much more strongly, I don't know if that's been fixed or not, so I'm just gonna campaign for the NPP anyways, uh, then, likely, toss up, uh, let's see, NPP safe, deep south, leading NPP, uh, deep south might not be, Bad. We haven't screwed up too hard yet, so. Torted an MPP. So let's do the deep south. Why not? Cool. And right now we're already already doing budget stuff. Build, build, build. Well, that's a lot of debt. Wow. Counter protest in Birmingham. One week ago, civil rights activists held a protest in Birmingham, Alabama, that quickly devolved into a riot. Now, tens of thousands of people opposed to the civil rights movement have staged a counter march, waving the flags of the Confederacy, their home state, and even a few swastikas. In comparison to the previous week, the police chief didn't even bother deploying more than a few lightly equipped beat cops. Several which join in the protest. Furthermore, the reports that pro civil rights activists attempting to flock to Birmingham to continue the movement have been driven out of the city by police and locals alike, with several would be protesters returning home battered and bruised. With the rising violence in Birmingham and elsewhere, Vice President Kennedy has reportedly convinced President Nixon to consider federalizing the Alabama National Guard and deploying it to restore order in that state. Even more worrying, the South African plan. I love South Africa. Uh, we're not training any soldiers, which, we, which is fine. So, an instant question of geography. Miss Denison, Denson, why is there a big empty space on the map? The grade 8 teacher looked towards the big wall map that the young girl was pointing to in a large gray space in Eurasia that uh, Miss Denson remembered being colored red for the Soviet Union when she was in school 30 years before, but now labeled Russian anarchy. If you looked at an atlas, cartographers would have tried to outline where the biggest warlord groups were, but that changed every year. Sometimes over a week as one group would rise in power and another declines. She didn't envy that thankless and never-ending job. Well, Mary, that is where Russia used to be, Miss Denson replied. Why isn't there a rush anymore? Mary asked. It's complicated, Miss Denson replied before flipping open her book to continue talking about the curriculum mandated discussion of Manifest Destiny. But isn't that history and we are in a history class? Mary asked again. Miss Denson said, Alright, oh, short version. 
from what I know. The Germans defeated the Soviet Union in the war, but it didn't take over the whole country, leaving the rest to be fought over. Some were communists like in the old Soviet Union, while others wanted to bring back the old empire, and others wanted to be democratic like us here in the States. She said, now if you can turn to, why can't they just get all, just get together and beat up the Germans? Andrew asked, I bet my dad would join the army to kick Germany's booty again. Andrew, that's not a good word to use. Booty is a bad word to use, guys. Miss Denson admonished. But by now, the whole classroom was talking, or more appropriately yelling, about how their dad or brother or they themselves, or probably their uncle or grandfather, would work with the unified Russia to beat up Germany again, totally derailing the class. Ms. Denson sighed, but the bell rang a moment later, hopefully ending the talk about the sad, sad story of Russia for now. Class dismissed. Cool. Uh, let's see. I, I can't remember. I was going to say something else. Uh, with some national spirits here, such as the last bastion of liberty. We've got the American Malays. Uh, Jim Crow, which I usually say I love things, but I'm not going to say I, I love that, so... <clears throat> Somewhat united with OFN, that's it. Cracking Fortress Europe. President Nixon stared at the world map projecting onto a screen in the White House briefing room. At the center was America, encircled, facing the Japanese and the colonial minions to the west, and the Germans and their slave empire to the east. But where the Japanese Americans had only recently escaped Armageddon's embrace in Hawaii, the Nazi emperor was fraying as it seems. Hitler grew older and more firm by the day. No amount of clever camera work and pre-recorded speeches could hide his creaking gait. His once mesmerizing oratory shrunken into senile ramblings. Germany's moon landing was not a triumphant, or was not a triumph. It was an epitaph. Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird looked up from his latest CIA intelligence brief on the German Reich. It's a house of cards, Mr. President. Britain chafes under a foreign occupier. Brittany already deals with us in secret. And the Norwegians continue to resist decades of occupation. And their African colonies wither on the vines without support. All held together by a man who can't finish a sentence without forgetting how it started, Nixon noted. When Mr. Hitler goes, his successors will fall over themselves to split the spoils, like Alexander's generals did in antiquity. Laird hand over a sheaf of documents from the CIA folder. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. We'll never get another chance, or another shot at crippling the Nazis like this. It's time to get back to the old world. I remember what I wanted to say now. We're on patch, cutting room four, patch G. I did want to say that just because in the future there'll be further updates, and I want to make sure that you guys know where we are standing with this. Also, I'm building a lot of civilian factories. Just that's what I normally do. And eventually we'll have uh, some sort of deal with Guiana here. So let's actually look at this. Uh, actually, soldiers. Are you guys good at naval invading? Oh, and defense of the stars. Um, defense, amphibious, 25% attack. Now the marines, 25% attack. Set, oh, jeez. Yeah, maybe we'll just use the marines. So, John Glenn stood before an assembled mass of scientists, engineers, science enthusiasts, and journalists. He'd always spoken with a few people and shared their frustration in NASA's situation, talked about his experiences as an astronaut, and even signed a couple of autographs. Now, he needed, he needed to make a big old splash. I'd just been having a pleasant dream about my last mission, when my good friend James Webb woke me with the news. I was distraught, to say the least. I know that the government was giving up on the future of space travel, partly because of the thought of never going up there my... Though going up there myself, again, is saddening to consider, but that's not the only reason. By involving our involvement in space, President Nixon has given up his accepted stagnation and decline, abandoning the stars of the fascist powers. He says we lost the space race, but as long as the stars still shine, space will never be lost. I implore that president, this president will reconsider his options. The future of America and human species as a whole lies above us. About 20 minutes later, Glenn made his closing remarks and was greeted by raucous applause. He felt satisfied with, at his words had hit their mark, and with so many journalists in attendance, tomorrow's papers will carry them still further yet. But he still felt defeated. His words alone will not be enough to save at NASA. Save NASA. If American space travels to have a future, it will need a voice to represent it in the halls of power. John Glenn had never been one for politics, but as he thought on it, he realized that political office may be his best course of seeing his dreams fulfilled. As he drove home, he recalled the Ohio governorship was up for election in a few months. It was almost a crazy thought, and yet, an astronaut in office? Why not? And just in case, I'm not sure how many guys we can send for a naval invasion, so... Uh, let's say we'll go there. And let's say, hypothetically, we will also go from here to... Uh, Right there. Let's just say hypothetically. Hypothetically, of course. These guys are ex very well versed in warfare, and you guys are already experienced yourselves. Cool. After the South African plan, expand American business ties, and an inspired NPP campaign. The results of our re most regional campaign has been middling at best. A series of gra gaffes by multiple candidates have attracted quite a bit of negative attention. Fundraising wasn't where it needed to be, and many of the state and House Senate campaigns are having trouble attracting volunteers and organizers. Our prospects for this most recent cycle as of, of now isn't going anywhere close to our deal. Expanded business ties. If we truly defend South Africa from fascist encroachment, we need to make it worth defending. If we can encourage American businesses to invest in South Africa, not only can we expect support and even financing from them, but we can also expect no more complaints and no need or no... Need no further justification to defend South Africa. No one will be able to complain. Money's upon the line after all. 
honestly, with these elections and stuff, if you'd like to read about them, please go right ahead. I mean, they're pretty... They haven't a whole bunch, so I'm not really too worried about it. So, German spy arrested. According to his landlord, Joseph Greenberg was a rather unassuming fellow. He had paid his rent on time, never had any noise complaints, and always helped mess old Connors carry groceries up the stairs. In reality, this was all cover, something the landlord learned when she opened Greenberg's empty apartment to the site of piles of surveillance equipment and the folders with swastikas stamped upon them. Thinking quickly, she called the police who in turn informed the FBI and arrested Greenberg this morning as he left for work. Joseph Greenberg was revealed to actually be Joseph Hansen, an agent for the German Abwehr. Ironically disguised as a Jewish American, his mission was to secure a job at Bell, Phone Tele Bell Telephone, study their communications infrastructure, and identify flaws for the installation of wiretaps and other espionage methods. Even more concerning was that his phone book had the telephone number of several local NPP politicians inside, and it seems like he was trying to contact the party's fringe elements, including the fascist agitator, Big Old Daddy, Francis Parker Yaki. Charges for violation of the Espionage Act are already being brought against him, and though he was will likely end up being simply deported back to Germany rather than facing a long-term prison term in the U.S. That's one less Nazi to worry about. Very nice. M M OK Jr. speech. I say to you today, my friends, that in spite of the difficulties and frustrations of the moment, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hill of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the former, of fo of former s slave owners will be able to sit to get down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a desert state, desert state, sweltering with the heat of injustice and oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of the skin, by the content of the character. I have a dream today. On the steps of Lincoln Memorial, prominent civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. gave a speech to a grand crowd of over two, a quarter million people. His words have already spread across the country like wildfires, men and women, black and white alike, spread a new slogan, I have a dream, the time for action is now. Nice. Uh, I think we wanted to do this, but... It already did that one, so we won't just keep going that way, right? Did I already read that one or not? Yeah, money's upon the line now. So, Secretary of State Rogers was well familiar with the steps of South African tango. A South African ambassador would ask in vague generality about admission to the OFM, but without any real plans for common defense or tariff liberalization. The Secretary would, in turn, respond with the vague updates on South Africa's application, now nearly a decade old. As soon as both parties, the South Africans wanted a, the threat of OFN membership to cow the Germans, and the OFN needed to preserve the last democracy in Africa. <clears throat> Neither, however, wanted German inter intervention which OFN membership could provoke. Thus, the South African tingle continued on without without end. How can I help you today, Mr. Ambassador? Roger struck out a neutral tone into his highest boredom. He was near certain that the response would be entirely predictable. We're doing very well, and about that OFN application would be the usual response. The Germans are making their move, Ambassador Wilhelm Christian now declared. Hetzog's born nationals are taking or talking to the Germans. South Africa's in danger, we need America's help. That got Roger's attention as his stomach dropped at the moment's unexpected turn in the decade-long discourse. What kind of help are we talking about? Financial, intelligence, but above all, military. Nod said firmly, if the Boers and Germans want to fight, they won't make it easy for them. No more dancing, no more games. Cool. And here's what we're doing. Oil processing, army interoperability, military construction, and horizontal industrial organization. Because America's got to be at the tip-top pace of research. Reno. Uh, GDP growth is not bad. National debt, that's a lot of debt. That's a lot of deficit. Holy crap. The other America, though. Men and residents of the post-war Europe often heard stories about life in the promising U.S. Children listened in intently. As the grandparents spoke of immigrants... Going from rags to riches within a few years of their arrival. Seeing how the fatherland neglected to print stories about life in the U.S., citizens under the jackboot could only rely on their relatives for an accurate portrayal. It was uncommon for foreigners to contemplate whether there truly was poverty in the promised land of America. Michael Harrington's book, The Other American, debuted in, debuted in bookstores across the country today. Though the novel discusses the issue of poverty in the U.S. and exposes readers to a significant number of Americans living below the poverty line. Harrington claims that many poor residents live in social isolation and are not commonly seen by the middle and upper classes. He calls for politicians to take immediate and remedial action to rid the country of every aspect of poverty. Critics of the novel disagree with Harrington's social tendencies, but most readers agree that the call to action. The book has already gained influence on the number of politicians in the capital who want to create a better country for every citizen, rich or poor. Economists are already devising ways to make education and health care more accessible in the country. America's biggest mis misconception? Debunked. Harrington, is that... Is that the same Harrington that you can elect as president? Now, I played as, you know, like I said, RFK and Glenn, but I've also played as all six 1972 presidents before, just as a little sneak peek of what the devs are up to, so. But please, come on, keep building civvies. Polls are updated. If you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. This happens every campaign, so. And as far as I know, you can't trust the polls, especially in modern day, but we'll see what happens. As long as we can get, like, a few more, oh, actually, guys for the MPP, that's totally fine with me. Intelligence analysis. Oh, sure, why not? 
Oskoda, damage your ability to German and, and disruptions. Diminish far right, far the center. Oh, uh, let's do. Oh, we'll see what we can do. As long as we spend more money, we'll have a better chance of doing everything, right? There you go. Uh, operation commence. Cool. Best of luck to them. Uh, you need more money. There you go. And that's all right. Cool. After this, a commitment to African de democracy. Oh, we'll do this one. Coupon was fervently sticking his hand across the satchel. It passed by a notebook, some coins, a column, and a photo of his mother before finally reaching its intended destination, his ID card. Taking it out, he handed it mutely to the man in front of him, a U.S. Army soldier. After taking a glance at the car, the soldier handed it back to him and said, Very well, you can carry on. Coupon placed it back in his bag and walked past the soldier without replying. He gets pulled aside about once every week on his way to work with how few people there are in Nuke. You'd think about how the soldiers will come to recognize who he is and what his face looks like. He doesn't mind it much, however. The Americans tend to keep it to themselves, much more than the Danes did anyways. Still, he wishes it didn't have to make him late for work. The commute just got a little longer. So, Africa is a bad word continent, near wholly controlled by despots and fascists with what little free lands remaining have been returned to the Stone Age. Even in the darkest of rooms, there is a beacon of light. And just as we are the light of democracy for the world, we shall defend South Africa and make them the beacon of democracy and light in a dark continent. They run a respectable campaign, huh? Solid campaign, nice. The call. The Oval Office, in a rare moment of peace, less lies silent. No aid stand by... No cameras are present and no interruptions are tolerated. Not on the cusp of such crucial news. President Nixon sits at his desk anxiously signing a few inconsequential documents. Shooting a few expectant glances at the telephone to his right, he realizes the pile of unsigned papers has been exhausted. Just as he kicks back in the chair to relax after a long day, his phone rings. <clears throat> He already knows the caller, and for what reason he calls. The National Assembly of Guyana would soon finish voting on the National Security Act. William Rogers would be the first to know the results. Give it to me straight, Rogers. It was a landslide, Dick. Barely more than a quarter voted down. They're afraid of Burnham. Burnham. Nixon muses. Well, they should be. Now more than ever, he'll crack down on anyone who threatens a peace. Political rivals, anti-segregationists, anyone and everyone. Rogers declares. Why do we put that dude in power anyway? So the press is just going to have a field day. Nixon slams his phone back into the cradle, laying back in his seat and rubbing the bridge of his nose. He knows that that disaster looms. What have we gotten ourselves into? A whole big old fun time. Lots and lots of fun, and then next up we'll do protecting our interests. With the newly realized importance of South Africa, it is essential that we gain a foothold there before anything else occurs. Not only will this allow us to react quicker to anything that occurs to our lamp of democracy in Africa, but it'll also help with justifying interventions to our own population. After all, we ought to protect our troops overseas, and you'd be hard-pressed to find an American who disagrees. Very, very cool. You know what I love? I love it when the CIA has operational success. Victory! Our mission was successfully accomplished, and all men are returning home safe and sound. This is a rousing success or victory for the CIA, along with America and the free world. With our tracks covered and the world a bit safer, we can rest easy preparing for our next incursion against those fascist dogs. Well done, gentlemen. Eight more experience. Great. Um, oh, we'll do a house divided. A house divided cannot, or divided against itself, cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it to cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other, Abraham Lincoln. Though the institution of slavery was torn down at the end of the Civil War by the 13th Amendment, a failed reconstruction decades of Jim Crow ensured that the issue of race would not or could not be solved. As the divides within the Republic Democrat Party grow, debates turning to fights, and friends turning to enemies. The truth only becomes clearer and clearer. The party as it stands cannot be saved. Yet there is still time to act. America must once again reckon with its issues of race, be it through words or war. We can only pray for less blood to be shed this time around and for the fate of the world rests upon this near divided house. Can't, can't you two just play nice? So the party splits. Now I don't know how that happened. Usually I, I think we have to really, 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 really mess up to get that to happen but... Oh well. Actually how much experience do we have? Um, the current analysis capability is 6. Current experience is 33. Okay, and I don't think we can choose anything else here because we need more experience. Totally fine. We're going to do that. And Oxa? Oxta? Sure. Uh, we could do that. What else can we do stuff? Yes. Oh, yeah, we get to spend all this money off screen. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just do that probably off screen maybe a little bit, but the Urgun Jewish... Oh, paramilitaries? Yeah, we'll try that maybe. I love it. just if you spend enough money, you'll probably succeed. Ninety-eight percent chance. Operation commence. Best of luck to them. And conversations from the street. The two young men walked down the streets of L.A., basking in the midday sun. But the topic of the conversation was distinctly gloomier. So did you hear about the Nazi spy that ca they caught out in New York? They're going to say they're going to try to get in touch with Yaki of all people. It's crazy, isn't it? The other replied, "I know how much they hate the Japs." Hell, 
who doesn't hear around here, but I never thought they'd get in bed with the Krauts. The spy was just reaching out to them, didn't say nothing about them agreeing to anything, the first man continued. The two men, like plenty of others out in California, had their own sympathy towards the NPP. After all, everyone in L.A. or the Bay Area had to live only a few miles away from the humiliating reminder of 1945, and the NPP were the only ones who seemed to have any sort of interest in getting the treaty ports back. He turned his friend to his ass and asked him, so what do you think? Was Yaki in on it or not? And it's, it's weird. It's weird. It's very, very weird that this event here can really determine which route you're going to go down. Of course, this as well as the Civil Rights Act, both those that really, you know, t can turn you a certain way towards uh, the path where we're going to take America. But it's really weird, this, especially this one. It just seems like a normal event. So he's definitely wearing later hosing under his things. Shift in favor. Sounds like a commie load of bull. Oh, we got to go NPP with this one, my friends. So we'll see what happens. Oh, nice. Very nice. Oh, we got two of them done. I love it. I love having four uh, slots here. Yes, please. Uh, anything else for 1962 here? We got that one going along. Nope, we're all good right here. So, uh, I got that one done too. How's the army looking? 1962. Uh, all these upgrades are... Uh, I guess we can get some anti-air. We could probably shift some factors over there. But not long nods with the sunrise. William Rogers sits quietly on a large, ugly couch. <clears throat> Oh, my apologies. Listening intently to the daily news morning, the me recent passing of the National Security Act has allowed the Guyanese government to seize hundreds of critical uh, critics and political agitators, as well as executing dozens more. The Guyanese President Forbes Burnham has stated that the raid strengthened the Guyanan Republic and his democratic system, exiled former President Chetty Jagan issued a statement. A couple dozen people crowded the room, aides, secretaries, and even a few senators all sitting in pure silence as the low hum of the TV and its tinny speakers recite the unfortunate news. Roger sighs, deciding he has heard enough. Standing up, he shuffles over to the TV and turns it off. He turns around looks at the two dozen or so people crowded in the sitting room, their expectant eyes locked upon him, their eyes awaiting his word. He pauses for a moment. No one speaks to the press. Not yet. Not the press secretary. Not me. Not any of you. Not, in, not a word until we figure out a next step. Understand? A series of nods acknowledges the statement. Now, someone give me a phone line to the president. We need to arrange a cabinet meeting quickly. Yes, Mr. President, we need to do this now. Popularity grows a little bit, eh? Hmm. And we still have almost $16 billion in debt. Wow. It's all right. We're going to build a lot. A family dinner. The directions building cafeteria was a common haunt for senators on lunch break. Today, they would play a host to a most prestigious pair. Vice President JFK sat thoroughly chewing on a trick of sandwich. Opposite him sat a smiling man who the party registry knew him as the chief of staff, but who John always had known as his brother. It's been too long since we've taken time to ourselves, said John with a smile. How are you, Bobby? Ethel still taking good care of you, I hope? Robert Francis Kennedy laughed at the playful wink his brother gave him. I can hardly complain on the home laugh, Jack. His fin grated. Was grin faded. Still, current events haven't exactly been great for my sleep. The older candidate nodded sympathetically. The violence is getting worse for sure, he frowned. Nixon being a stick in the mud about it isn't helping things either. He still won't endorse any legislation on the matter. Can't you do something about it? As long as the president sits on the fence, things will only get worse. I'd love to, but you know how Nixon is, remembered John. Idly stirring his coffee, knowing him, he'd probably just veto whatever we put in front of him and yell at us for fracturing party unity. But this is far more important than party unity, Jack. There are millions of Americans, good, millions of good, honest people, being cast aside for things that are far beyond their control. The longer we wait, the greater their suffering will be. Fixing his brother with an intense but encouraging look, he continued, You're the vice president. At the very least, you can use your voice in the name of those who have no voice. John was silent for a moment, then he smiled. You've always been a good man, Bobby. Of course, you're right. I must act. Family matters and the media slams Nixon. Typical. Although President Nixon's sweeping electoral victory two years ago may prove that he once enchanted the American people, it seems that the magic that swept them to the polls in the 1960s wearing off for many of them. And many of those people who also happen to be journalists at a nationally syndicated newspapers. Headlines riddled with pun-laden insults seem to be everywhere, and, Nix and titles like Nixon needs fixin', did he trickin', dick in a pickle, and lawlessness and disorder fill the newsstands. Their main source is the rising tensions of the civil rights movement in the South and specifically the president's inability to properly contain it. The man who once staved off nuclear Armageddon or so would we claim would he now seem powerless to stop a bunch of student protesters and racist hoodlums from squaring off and his image is deteriorating as a result. And Nixon, who seems impish and anemic when compared to the VP, Kennedy's charms and charisma needs all the positive press he can get. All he can do right now is hope that they will eventually change their tune, although he cynically insists that the press has a grudge against them that they simply will not let go. They've got it out for him. Oh, they definitely do. Oh, the opposition's campaign. We got it done soon. Hey, great success. Mongolian Civil War. Well, we don't care about Russia right now. Oh, a little bit of that. Cool. Even more experience. Great. Uh, let's see. They may be dudes, but there are dudes. Uh, what? Yeah, we can do it again. Africa. I love Africa. Uh, Operation Jewel. An Angola Friends in Power. I kind of want to do that one. That sounds like fun. Operation Surface? Yeah, why not? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, there you go. Just throw more money at. Thank you. All right, we can pick a research. Um, I kind of like the political power growth. We might actually meet, need more political power, so... Belly buses, huh? Very nice. Honestly, we're not that far ahead. It's only May, so the meeting. President Nixon sits at the head of the table, bolt up, right a contemplative look on his face. All along the magnificent mahogany table, the presidential cabinet is seated. From Secretary of Veterans Affairs, far at the end, to Jack Kennedy and her H.R. Haldeman, sitting next to the president. So far, no one has said a word aside from a few curt greetings. H.R. Haldeman breaks a palpable silence. I think we all need to know why we're here. Our friends in Guyana have gone too far, and we need to do something about it. Uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Robert McNamara, follows Haldeman's lead and speaks next. Nixon will still bearing an angry yet contemplative look. The president doesn't know our involvement in this election. In his election, we need a threat in constricting economic ties, sanctions, con condemnation, diplomatic, isol- Frankly, Bob, he'll get trade from somewhere else. Heck, when Germany gets back on its feet, then we'll all be in trouble because that's where he'll get it from. The crowds will jump at the chance for an all ally right on our doorstep. Kennedy cuts in his sharp Massachusetts accent grabbing the attention of the room. What do you suggest, McNamara asks? Well, use our cloud in the country. Threats, bribes, and blackmail. McNamara shakes his head. No, we'll just apply pressure for him to repeal the act. If we threaten him, he'll double down on his opposition. Any MP of theirs can he success might turn against him or face retribution. We can't top that if for only moral reasons. Slowly, the room evolves into conflicting arguments. Various cabinet members arguing for an exile army, others for isolation. Suddenly, a voice cuts through the clamor. That's enough. The head of the table spoken. Richard Nixon stands and then speaks. I don't care about it either way. I just want the press and burn them both to calm the heck down. Force them, pressure them. It doesn't matter. Get the act repealed. He turns to Haldeman, nodding. I'll do it either way, but I want your word, Haldeman. So, I don't remember the last time I chose this when I played as, uh, or wanted to get RFK. So, social democracy to repeal it or else... I think that's, I went that way because this makes more sense because that's a, a center NPP or NPP center. So uh, sanctions are enough to pacify and get the press to calm down. We'll try that. We'll try that. So our commitment, protecting our interests. With the newly realized importance of South Africa, it is essential that we gain a foothold there before anything else occurs. Not only will this allow us to react quicker to anything that occurs through the lamp of our democracy in Africa, but also help with ju justifying interventions to our own population. After all, we ought to protect our troops overseas and you'd be hard pressed to find an American who disagrees. Nice. Polls are updated. All right, I don't really care about the polls too much. South America, yes, yes, and Central America, yes, yes. Anywhere else we don't have? Hey, run a massful campaign. I don't really care. Oh, uh, yeah, Oceania, Southeast Asia, East Asia. Yes, it's only money. So uninspired. Oh, come on, guys. I know we're currently led by the RDS, but let's not suck it up. Operation success. Awesome. And I do know this campaign's going to be a little bit longer than most normal ones, just because America's got so much here. Oh! Oh! Fund the Gibraltar Dam. Stabilize Iberia. Oh, what is this? Damage the ability to conduct... A, con, hurt Germany, basically. Polish Underground. Germanization projects. Forces in Serbia. Oh. Insurrectionists in Serbia. Huh. Alright, well. Cherry. Charity. Not bad. We have three activations as well. Nice. Belly Buster's coming along, and the next research will be done in 10 days. Not too shabby. And with that, South Africa secured. Every other morning, a gaggle of New York investors concludes a successful tour of De Bayer Diamond Mines throughout the Transvaal. Every other week, a ship carrying crates of newly stamped guns, factory fresh trucks, and a hundred other hundred tons of ammo leaves the port of South Louisiana for Cape Town's distant shores. And every other fortnight, a flight of C-13 cargo to planes depart into the wild blue yonder with a complement of desert warfare and Africans trained advisors in tow. For all intents and purposes, South Africa is now a member of the world's last concert of democracies. The OFN now shares its watch along with the Orange and the Zambezi. Sir Graf now trusts that the free world shall prevent war from imperiling his nation's survival. Pray that trust not be tested. Need not be tested. Good, good, good. Alright, so what we're going to do, what, where? The Deep South. Uh, I might still go with Deep South then. Let's see the Deep South. Yeah, let's, get, let's do the Solid South, as someone did say. Or CIA report, South Africa. Secret the situation prospects in South Africa. Truncated for brevity. Conclusions. The South African Federation faces similar issues to, of, our own, of our own civil rights. Despite never having implemented the so-called apartheid system proposed by the National Party, the continuing lethal social, uh, legal social economic inequality between black and white South Africans are prime breeding grounds for social unrest, something the already weakened government cannot afford. Boer agitation in the northwest of South Africa has grown strong in the past two years, especially as the government moves to pass legislation addressing racial inequality. The Boers live relatively isolated from wider South African society 
held proud traditions of political independence and armed defense, and an organized uprising is likely in the near future. C. A direct invasion by South Africa's northern, northern neighbors, African Rex Commissariats, would be very unlikely in the current situation, as they almost entirely rely on their mother nation to provide material and political support to prop up the governments. All their military forces are tied up in internal peacekeeping operations, but should the support be withdrawn, their actions may turn erratic to a point of losing any sense of predictability. The YD. The wide American public would not be vehemently opposed to direct intervention in South Africa should the situation change to require. Truncated for brevity, secret understood. Nice. Let's grab more Max Factories in the state. Thank you very much. Oh, can't do anything else there. Oh, did I do this yet? No, we don't. That's yeah, fine. Uh, I can grab some of this because we can. Nice, nice, nice. I love it. After we protect our interests, South Africa is secured. Operational success once again. Brazil, good job. Brazil, good job. Uh, do we more? Oh, we need more money. There you go. I don't care how much it costs. We gotta have a massive organization. Operation Chair, you betcha. Nice. Commenced. Oh, reports for duty. Class with triumvirate. over it. Langley's informed us that it is clearly it has cleared its latest operative for field operations effective immediately. The resources dedicated to training are now available to reallocate it to other priorities. New operative and 25 XP. Not bad, not bad, bad. Cool. Alright, after this, South Africa. Af South Africa secured. Oh, the RDs grow a little more unified. Actually, we want to, I want to double check that to see how unified they really are. Only 203 political pa uh, factories? Alright, let's take a look here. So, uh, the RD is ready for anything. That's that, but I already said it was, we were disunited. MPP is working well together. American society is somewhat united and will have no significant electoral effects. Operational success? Love it. Wasumbrella. Well, let's go to Africa and see what's going on down here. SR Feast. Sure. Nice. Oh, and recruit. It's fine. We're going to be recruiting a lot of people. We've got two days left for the opposition. Ooh, NPP in Oregon and Washington. Nice. Middling campaigns. Not bad. And I do have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and uh, warm. Oh, good. Let them kill each other. Oh, cool. The Forgotten Allies? Why not? The Old Anton assumed the German... The, actually, no. Uh, actually, no. I'm going to read that one yet. I do want to do this one. We, ha we have to do decide this one, so... Uh, so, I think last time I, I did I vetoed it, which was really cool and all, but I think we got to go with the Kennedy plan. So, we'll go back to the German stuff here, but we got to do... We gotta, I need to pass the Civil Rights Act. Kennedy is a rare breed. One of the last progressive Democrats and a rising star in the Republican Democrat Party. He's seen as a great uniter. Many see him as the only one only chance to keep the two sides of the party together. Despite great distaste for him held by the American people, he has proposed a plan despite President Nixon's sentiment to finally end this crisis within a Civil Rights Act, or with a Civil Rights Act, to immediately equalize all citizens of this country. Stagnation in Senate, blackmail in the White House. The original manila envelope in the White House staffer's desk had nothing that struck him as unusual, save uh, for the absence of a return address. He tore the end open and peeked inside, finding nothing more than a small bundle of papers and photographs. But when he saw what they were, his blood ran cold. Internal memos from the 1960 Progressive National Convention, transcripts of private conversations between NPP senators, schematics and wiretaps, photos taken inside the NPP campaign headquarters, and most chillingly, a letter from Chief of Staff's H.R. Haldeman authorizing the espionage. At the bottom of the envelope was a note card with a message typed on it, unless you want this on the front page of the Post next week, contact me and we'll talk with the address of a 4 PO box printed on the other side. The staffer had enough wits about to immediately reseal this envelope, call the FBI, and pass it on to them. In under an hour, it was only on J. Edgar Hoover's desk. A brief call to Nixon informed him that the staff agreed to stay quiet. The Bureau's top men were already set on tracking the blackmailer down. And it'll all be over in a matter of a few days. Time to call some plumbers. The polls are updated. Cool. A solid campaign. Not bad. Not, not bad. Yeah, we got to pass the Civil Rights Act, so. That's the way that we got to make sure we get some really fun, as some might say, gamer dude in office. Nice. Oh, Asia. What are you going to do about Asia? Hurting Japanese st domestic stability? Korean resistance? Vladivostok. Oh, that's not bad. Aid Hawaiian Freedom Fighters? Not bad. Not bad. Let's go and do that one. Nice. Operation commence. Pretty good. What? Alright, my apologies about that. Someone was at my door, so. Oh, Tito. 
intensification of the movement. Though the civil rights movement has always been present, especially after our defeat in the Second World War, recent reports have indicated an increase in violence, polarization, and popularity both for and against the movement. Even Congress isn't free from the issue, and the progressives and the Republican and Democrat Party constantly in conflict with the segregationists and the conservatives. And amongst it all, the MPP revels in the chaos. It seems that the populace is no longer satisfied with their platitudes, finally recognizing our feet dragging for what it is. We can only continue to stay the course for so long. The nation of America is taking sides is only so long before they arm themselves. Oh boy, I can't wait. There's still plenty of time. You know, we, all, we all know there's plenty of time, you know. Just let them, you know, everyone just kind of get really angry with each other. And let it all blow over as we spent $20 billion. My goodness. We're not really spending that much on the military spending. I mean, we spend more on construction, we spend more on civilian spending. Holy cow. All right. So, the toss up in the West Coast. Leaning, leaning. Oh, let's see, Illinois, not bad. The Deep South is a safe MPP victory, not bad. Leaning RD, toss up. Uh, I want to do West Coast one more time, maybe. Let's see what happens. It's only July 28th, so it's not too bad. It's been more crack in the facade, huh? Operational success, very nice. And we're going to do the Kennedy plan. So, the National Security Commission, or Council, had been gathered by the order of the President and recommendation by the Treasury Secretary... McNamara. Now, Bob, you told me this ain't just about the Madagascar blockade. It better not be. You told me there'd be no hang-ups on that issue. Not at all, Mr. President. McNamara shifted slightly in his seat. The director of the CIA actually asked me to have you convene the council. He glanced at the director who held a pipe to his lips. His mouth curled into a glib, glib smile. Get on with it, then. The president urged with a puff of smoke. He leaned in and began. Mr. President, we have contacts high up within the German colonial administration of Madagascar. We have total reason to believe that they have some misgivings about their loyalties to Berlin. With the weakening of the German Empire and with Hitler becoming increasingly ill, it has become apparent that a conflict may break out on the island sooner rather than later. We have word that rebels are planning to make their move soon and the local government is divided. Nixon shrugged. Who are those contacts? Can we, sure be, can we be sure of their sincerity? McNamara pushed his glasses further up his nose for a dramatic effect. The director puffed again from his pipe. Mr. President, our contact is Rex Commissar Emil Maurice. Nixon seemed stunned for a moment, but collected himself quickly. My goodness, that's great. And then he has a direct line of Hitler? The director nodded. Maurice is one of Hitler's oldest confidants. The relationship has been strained as of late, which is partly why he wants out, and his word, we think, is good. Nixon nodded in silence for several moments before continuing. Well, darn it, keep me updated on this. If you find any way to breach the bastion... You let me know immediately. Let's see if we can make a dent in the Unity Pact. Hmm. This water's pretty good. Assist Chinese Rebels. Mm-hmm. I wonder if the Kenpai Tai has anything here. Oh, memor mem Memorandum. Situation in South Africa. Classification secret from the CIA. Subject South African Political Assessment. The question of the vast uh, vacant monarchy in South Africa symbolizes the political tensions pulling the nation between the German Reich and the remainder of the free world. The upcoming referendum has inflamed these divisions with pro-German and Boer-led National Party led by Albert Herzog arguing to establish or abolish, actually, to abolish the monarchy against the status quo United Party PM de Villiers Graf. With reports of German weaponry flooding Bloemfontein and with political violence escalating, see memorandum assassination of B.J. Volsta. CIA assets report widespread concern in Cape Town that the referendum is covered for a declaration of Boer independence. This would rob South Africa of much of its strategic depth and provide a pretext for German in intervention to support its new client state. Simultaneously, protests by the African National Congress against widespread discrimination continue to, roll, to royal the nation. The movement continues to gather strength despite its incarceration of much of the ANC's executive leadership, and moderates are increasingly being sidelined by militant radicals. The center seems to cannot hold much longer. Quite Quite worrying. All right, we gotta wait and see what we can do down there in search of a champion. Henry Jackson, affectionately known to his contemporaries as Scoop, sat at his desk, looking expectantly as a two-figure sitting opposite. Maureen Newberger, Scoop's deputy and fellow senator in the MPP center wing, quietly thumbed through her nose as she waited for him to speak. Next to her sat the nominal head of the center's more radical wing, Michael Harrington, who waited with the same expectant look as Scoop himself. The two could not be much more different, but as the center's leader, Scoop knew he needed both if the party was going to get anywhere. As you know, our election prospects are still looking pretty dire, began Scoop. The right still holds plenty of influence over the party, and no progressive voter is going to vote for the party whose last candidate was Strom, gosh darn, Thurman. Worst of all, we still don't even have a candidate. Well, it would help if anyone had bothered to put their name forward, joking, joked Harrington, with a bare hand of contempt. Perhaps if we were to do more to support our core working class voters in the Midwest and elsewhere, rather than kowtowing to the segregationists and filling our ranks with West Coast elitist types. Newberger herself, of proud Oregon stock, sat up with an offended look. Everyone here is fighting for the same thing. I've done plenty to speak up for the underprivileged. At least, I just don't sit around writing essays about it. Scoop still sat for a moment, smiling bemusedly as his colleagues continued to bicker and snipe at one another. In a way, they were a perfect reflection of the center as a whole, determined to enact change, but endlessly at its own throat about what would 
what what that change should be. Finally, he coughed, and the other two immediately ceased their childish exchange and looked to him once more. You're both very different, which is exactly why we need someone who can speak everyone's language. If we are to have any hope in this election, we need to move forward with one voice. Harrington and Newberger looked at each other, unsure of what to say. Scoop glanced out of the window with an uncertain look. I don't know who the man to lead us is, but he better show up soon, or we are screwed. Who will speak for the center? Well... Probably not RFK, but hey, you never know. Maybe. A note from Russia. Presidential briefing on the free state of Magadan. Contents. The nation of Russia has been a great unknown since the end of the Second World War. Following Barbarossa and the Soviet Union's collapse, the CIA could scarcely glean any information from that vast country, except for the Rus West Russian War of the 50s. The rush of our imagination has become a cesspool of violent infighting, with the German bombings preventing any attempts of regional warlords to consolidate power. At least it seems to be from the case in West Russia and Siberia. With well, a land area that stretched from the Baltic to the Pacific, there are some stretches of territory untouched by the banditry and chaos that plagues the areas adjacent to the German Reich. From central Siberia, the primary recipient of the Bukharan era Siberian plan. We have heard that a republic has risen and collapsed there between the Second World War and the West Russian War. Then there is the Russian Far East, a region that the CIA has been observing for quite some time in brief. The legitimate government of the Soviet Union, under the provisional leadership of Genrik Yagoda, retreated there after their defeat. Subsequently, the anti Bolshevik Front sprang out from Manchuria and Harbin, making significant gains before shattering into three parts based in Chita, Magadan, and Amur. A particular interest of this briefing is the free state of Magadan, led by Mikhail Mikhovsky, a local fascist of some repute. He and his foreign minister, Nikolai Petlin, as were promised reforms in democracy should the U.S. support their bid for, for the as Mikhovsky insisted, great crusade of Russia, as well as intelligence and information. The agency notes that the decision is a presence alone to make. However, it cautions the president supporting any fascist bid for Russia, however, and moreover. The aforementioned minister, Petlin, seems to be a more malleable candidate for leadership. Whatever the president decides, the agency should carry out. Lend him our tentative support in exchange for reforms. We could use the intel. And I do apologize that I'm speaking a little bit quickly. I speak quickly, very quickly, so it is what it is. Um, I just, we got to push through these, you know, events relatively quickly. So, the task of apprehending the unknown White House blackmailer was hardly difficult. The P.O. Box had been registered under a false name and paid for it in cash, so the FBI decided to play along and write a letter agreeing to the blackmailer's demands and asked to meet him in person. Surprisingly, the blackmailer showed up at suspecting nothing and was immediately nabbed by the federal agents. The blackmailer turned out to be 24 years 24-year-old NPP activist one Charles B. Juno, but they had little success getting more than that out of him. He had refused to say anything besides requests for a lawyer, but the fingerprint evidence has left no doubt to him being the one who sent the envelope. The Bureau's best guess is that he's a misguided progressive who wanted to force through change within or with some underhanded methods, but that's all they've got to go on. Charges of espionage and mail fraud are already working their way through the pipeline, and hopefully he'll go to trial by November. With any luck and a bit of nudging from the White House, it could get moved up to October or late September, meaning that he'll safely be behind bars when the midterm elections roll around. Three cheers to Hoover and his boys. Operation Success. Awesome. Operation Concord. Sure, the last liberty in the dark continent stays alive. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Operation Jewel. Keep our Anglo friends in power. Uh, we can do this one again. I don't really want to do that one again. Towards Franco or Salazar. Well, let's go with this guy. Franco's the guy we want to win. Nice. I don't care if it's 100%. Money. Yeah, money's bad, but whatever. Yeah, another leak. Richard Nixon stands in the Oval Office, thoughtfully looking out of a window. Dawn broke far on the horizon, a blazing orange-red sun rising in the distance, casting warming light across the White House lawn. He sighs, there's going to be another long, dull day. Meetings and bills and foreign policy. A sharp rap on the door jolts him slightly. Someone wanted a word at a quarter past six in the morning. Nixon pauses for a second, then nods, come in. H.R. Haldeman steps through the doorway, a newspaper rolled up in his fist. What is it? Nixon asks, bad news, Dick. We're not done with burning him yet. Without another word, Haldeman flings the paper down on the president's desk, turning it around such that Nixon could read the headline. Nixon supporting Dionysia. Congregation. Whistleblower, Nixon mutters to himself. He reads the article. Somehow the news found out. Somehow they knew the government got Forbes elected. Somehow they knew that Nixon administration still supported him and his racial segregation policies. Nixon rubbed his nose. Taking a deep breath, Haldeman, he starts to get Kennedy and Laird. Call a meeting. I need a phone line of the CIA director. Oh well, it is what it is, and I want to save as much PP as possible because we can. And tap for some coffee. That's a lot of depth. A solid campaign. Very nice, very nice. So polls are updated. All right, SMP holds on to power. Cool. Spend slash. Nice. Even though, I mean, honestly, the Mer America's military is not that big, so not super worried about it. And we have 23 days with opposition stuff. Uh, Operation Reimpound. Eh, Stabilizer beer. Sure, why not? Nice. Stagnation in the Senate. The Civil Rights Act simply means that uh that is. That it's another means, it's another effort on the part of this president to dominate the country by force and to put into effect these uncalled for and, un and gosh darnable proposals he'd recommend under the guise of so called civil rights. And I tell you, the American people from one side or the other had better wake up and oppose such a program, and if they don't, the next thing will be a totalitarian state in these United States. 
Efforts to move any sort of civil rights legislation through the Senate has yet again met resistance from conservatives within the party. This time, however, the filibusters and angry outbursts are delivered to a room with a very different atmosphere, with popular support for the bill only growing. Once such opponents are beginning to waver, and some MPP senators are beginning to approach and us protest in secret to give their support for the bill. Many experts are now predicting that the bill has a very ne real, real chance to passing the Senate, especially with the Vice President Kennedy's authorship. Tell Johnson to hurry up with those deals, how democracy dies. But Forbes Burnham was no idiot, or idiot, he really. He clearly knew that the key to executing any coup was not limiting communication during, only letting people find out about the coup once it was uh, fait accompli, or comp yeah. Which is why he made sure to invite the American and Canadian ambassadors to a formal dinner. While they ate filet and sipped champagne, the soldiers of the Guyanese Defense Force occupied the Parliament building, shutting down the switchboards and broadcasting stations, dragging MPs out of their homes and into police vans, and carried out summary court marshals and sentencing for particularly egregious traitors to the Republic. It was not until Ambassador Spencer King returned to American Embassy that he learned of what had transpired, and a jury-rigged chain of communications managed to put him back in touch with Washington. Nixon called an emergency meeting with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and what conclusion was reached, this shall not stand, not on our watch, we go to war with them. Hey, get some technology. And unfortunately, we're not going to do Jack Squat because we got Civil Rights Act of 1962. The Civil Rights Act is to be put up to a vote, and despite the President's objections, it will most likely pass. Nixon seems to have decided against vetoing it, which means any real opposition has begun to recede, but this does represent a great threat to the unity of a party. We'll sign into law. Segregation of the party will not be happy. If a bill attempts to go through the Senate, you can find the bill in your decisions tab. Oh, I love the whole bill thing here. So all 45 Republicans. The Republicans love the Civil Rights the senator loves as well, and we got six Democrats too, and none of the far right. Well, I'm not surprised at that. An internal investigation, though. Despite the jubilation about catching the blackmailer, the mood in the White House and Department of Justice building quickly turned sour when an unpleasant piece of information came forward. Charles Juno wasn't acting alone. There's no way that the envelope could have been screened and intercepted with the other oncoming mail unless a co conspirator on the inside had helped him get through it. Or get it through. The Secret Service immediately began investigating potential leads in this mail room, but did little success so far. The, the White House staff are all about whispering about something that's going on, and most of them suspect that it's an information breach that involves the NPP in some sort of way. <clears throat> Even worse are the rumors about going on another great scare is on the horizon, but directed at any and all NPP members. Although this is currently limited to the White House, and there are certainly very few professed NPP members in the Nixon administration, it would lead to widespread panic if news leaked to the rest of the executive branch of bureaucracy, let alone the press. This is getting complicated, and it's going to leak no matter what we're going to do. So, we might as well embrace it, embrace the suck, and keep building some more consumer goods. God, like I said earlier, I really, really would love to have a campaign restart as a clean Nixon. I love Tricky Dick. Oh, there we go. Oh, uh, what do we want to do? We did the West Coast last. Let's do somewhere else. Different. Great Lakes. Uh, Deep South. I'm liking the Deep South. The East Coast. RDs, RDs. Pennsylvania. Let's see. Ooh, you know, maybe we'll do... Eng Let's try New England. New England, shall we? Why not? Something a little different, right? I love the Silver Ice. Operational failure. What the bad words? What, we failed? Well, just throw more money at it. Right? Stabilize it? No, we gotta stabilize them. Execute. 37 experience, 3 active agents. Oh boy. Alright, next uh, thing I wanna read. And then we'll go back and do this one too. The Forgotten Allies. The old Entente assumed the German people had learned of love during the, the uh, Great War. They also assumed the German government had held true to its promises thereafter. Moreover, they assumed the German army had no business prevailing against the combined forces of the two world empires and that they would fold in a second war as they had in the first. Uh, rest in peace. If you want to read about this, please go right ahead. Germany proved them wrong in all three accounts and raised by, by raising the swastika over Paris and London. On that ignoble climax, has America since been forced to leave its allies' governments to Hitler's mercy? Operative word, says the CIA. Governments. With an appropriately sized black budget, the allies' rest of peoples be forgotten no longer. Nice. A silent spring. Man is part of nature, and his war against nature is a war against himself. There were a few of the these were a few of the chilling words marine biologist Rachel Carson used to decry America's ignorant addiction to pesticides in her newly released book, Silent Spring. A product of nearly four years of original research into government-funded eradication campaigns, a 400-page publication asserts that the chemicals used for pest removal, DDT, Aminor Triazol, D24D, harm far more than the vermin they were made to exterminate. They instead seep into the soil and render it impotent, she claims, and linger in the fruits and crops Americans eat. In response to the accusations, DuPont and 
Velsicle chemical filed La Belle suits against the researcher. Their efforts to preserve their standing have thus far been stymied by both the courts of law and the court of public opinion. The book itself has shot up to first place in New York Times bestsellers for nonfiction, a sign of the American people's approval of a whistleblower increasingly compared to Upton Sinclair. Leading scientists now remark that a national, nationwide ban of synthetic poisons, America's laboratories peddled is now only a matter of when. For the future, surf and safari makes waves. Southern California seems to take a to hold a near myth mythical status in the pu American public consciousness. As a land of endless summers, idyllic beaches, and gorgeous sunsets where you can live a carefree life on the surface and sand, of course. Many Californians would consider their life to be anything but carefree, but that doesn't stop people from believing what they want. This mythos is seeping into the media about California like film, TV, and especially music. A vocal harmony group from Hawthorne, California, who call themselves the Beach Boys, recently released their first album, Surf and Safari, to moderate success. While they've had regional success with a few singles, the producer of Capitol Records have surprisingly reported satisfactory sales of the album nationwide. So other so-called surf rock acts like Dick Dale and Jan and Dean are recording their own studio albums. Some are wondering whether they'll be also finding success away from the Pacific Coast. Is this the future of rock and roll? Eh, maybe. Oh, good, we got more success. Nice. We got them belly buses ready to go. And we can do this one too, why not? Will we fail at 99% chance? Maybe. Research? Do we have enough? No, we do not. Uh, Yeah, can we tell that we already got this one done? I guess not, huh? That sucks. Civil Rights Act for Ghan allies? Yes, please. The Civil Rights Act of 1962 passes. It was a bill that many senators knew that would bring much needed equality to the U.S. A nation had strived for the concept since the Declaration of Independence was signed. Historically, African Americans had little help from the government in their fight for freedom. Even the 15th Amendment only gave blacks the right to vote on paper. There's no way to enforce this policy, and over time, southern states exploited loopholes in order to maintain the status quo of the land. Poll taxes, literacy tests, infamous grandfather clause, all this would change when the senators voted in favor of passing the bill. Desegregationists rejoice. Southern politicians foamed to the mouth. This act sternly outlaws discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Unequal voting requirements were abolished. Schools, businesses, and other uh, public accommodations were officially desegregated. African Americans essentially gained the right to go to any school, work for any business, attend any public facility they chose. As a whole, African Americans had political power that the race had never seen before, and this was only the first step towards full desegregation. But not all was well within the South. Immediately, Southern voters flocked to Strom Thurmond's far-right MPP in hopes that the bill would re be reversed and that society would turn to normal. Many Southerners despised this blatant attack on their livelihood, and with the support from Southern politicians, they even had the power to physically defeat desegregation. Not only did the bill grant much needed reform, but also caused division in the U.S. not seen since the Civil War. May I remind you the federal government overrides a state? Uh, well, cool. We get equal rights. Southern Democrats announced their allegiance to the MPP. Oh, cool. Turning point for the history of our nation? Awesome. We got more research to do. Solid MPP campaign? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. And we have 35, so that's not too bad. So, awesome. Polls are updated. That's cool. Forgotten allies helping out a friend. Operational success. Very good. The first fallen domino. Resistance. English underground. Yep. Shared heritage, inseparable economic ties, and a common purpose forged in the Great War's fiery baptism has created a special kind of relationship between Uncle Sam and Fair Britannia. Theirs is the bond and adequately explained were the one only to examine the small parcels of their histories, whether as erstwhile colony and overlord, as adversaries in the world stage, or as allies against the fascist menace. Though Bren's wooden wall had broken before the Reich's assailments had made puppets of the free men, America's heart and minds yearn still to wrest their freedoms back, luckily a force which can be a effect such exists in Her Majesty's, Majesty's most loyal resistance. President Nixon pledges to uphold this special relationship both before and when America's other plays its hand. Class 3 Senate elections? I'll read this once, and then, uh, we'll see what happens. After months of politicking, spending debates, uh, stump speeches, and campaigns rising and falling, the big night is here. Americans from every walk of life are gathered around TV, radio sets, or on street corners to hear the news. Will the candidate win? Will their opponent go down in defeat? What will be the big news story tomorrow? What newcomer will upset the incumbent, or what damaged officer holder will defy the odds and get another term? That and more will be announced tonight. Of course, while the hundreds of races for mayors, governors, and representatives are important races in their own right, it's the Senate elections that most people are focused on. With the political people from the Republican, Democrat, and the National Progressive Party coalitions, the upper house of Congress has become the battleground for America's heart and ideals. The makeup of the Senate will soon be revealed to the waiting public. Shh, everyone be quiet. I can't hear the TV. Hoover's office. Good afternoon, Dick. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover said he stepped into the Oval Office, quietly shutting the door behind him. 
Nixon furled his brow and replied, I told you not to call me that. You told me a lot of things, Mr. President. Well, I've had to postpone the one press conference where the media wasn't going to be after my head, so this had better be good. Whatever it had to say wasn't good, but it certainly was important. The FBI's investigation into the origin of the blackmailers had seen little success, but there still remained the question of what to do with the blackmail itself. Hoover, ever cautious or considerate, asked the President whether it would be best to seal it away in some classified vault or to destroy it as much as possible. Either way, it would hopefully stay buried forever. Although it could, be, could be, see some value and hope in the future. The existence of the blackmail could, after all, provide a rather large boon to the president in the upcoming midterm elections. Burn it all. That's actually much smarter to do just to burn it all. But we're not here for that. We're going to keep them safe, keep them secret. You betcha. We're, we're totally going to do that. American businesses? Nice. Hopefully we don't fail that one. All right, so let's take a look. So the Republican Party lost five senators, the Democratic Party lost three, and the far right got eight? Is that all? Only eight? Oh, man. Well, the South is fairly solid. Well, they even have West Virginia, too. Forgotten allies. Hey, LBJ is in Texas. Far right's John Tower, huh? Strom Thurmond's still there, huh? All right, very cool. All right, helping out a friend, my friends. Why not? How are we doing? Are we still building a lot here? I hope so. CIA operative reports for duty. Very, very cool. All right. So we can probably close this one out and recruit another dude. Thank you. Understood. 18 XP. That's not good. We can't get anything here either. So. Operational success. Very cool. I guess we can do BT starts. Yeah, strength and pro American settlement. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Best of luck to them. Next focus. First Fallen Domino. In keeping with a lo its long, hollowed history of weaving polite fictions without, with, through force of will, the Reich has proclaimed Norway as a territory no less integral to its natural borders than the Rhineland and Bavaria. The Germanic people's shared destiny in Germany, presumable uh, fever dream, supersedes quarries laden with common sense, such as how many Norwegians buy their tripe, and how many Germans would give their lives for Oslo. There at least exists an answer to the first question, namely, scant few outside of the collaborator government sway. Were the Einheit Pact to line of dominoes, Langley surmises, then Norway's peace would wobble to and fro near the front, and with a gentle poke, stuff might just come crashing on down. Well, let's hope, at least. Um, what do we want? We're going to get eventually get involved in the war in Africa, so we have transport planes, so I like this one too. So. A colder war, shall we? This briefing was assembled at the behest of the Central Intelligence Agency, along with the Assets and UNISCOM. UCCOM. Warning, the following briefing film is classified as Secret Ice Zulu Bojum. If you do not have Secret Ice Zulu Bojum clearance, leave the auditorium now and report to your unit security officer for debriefing. Failure to observe this notice is an imprisonable offense. You have 60 seconds to comply. Video. A fisheye view of a foggy ocean, the waves lapping at the camera over and over again. All is silent. Save the sound of water until a faint foghorn breaks to the tranquility. Through the fog alone, fish and trawler, waving the English flag floats close to the camera. Activity on the deck as the men pull in lines and stow their hard-earned prize from the sea. A shadow can be seen deeper in the fog, larger and more imposing. A large, a loud foghorn is heard as a large vessel floats into view. With its imposing 15-inch guns, it's a vast assortment of antique aircraft weaponry and its large flying swastika. Voice over. This is the DKM Turfits, one of the Reich's largest battleships, and it just entered the Icelandic economic exclusion zone while escorting a fleet of British trawlers. This is a violation of our allies' sovereign rights and a national security threat to the U.S. assets. We can only assume that even more Kriegsmarine assets are operating in the area. We advise an immediate mobilization of U.S. forces in the area to counter the Reich's aggressive posturing. Sending more forces to the area? With more legitimacy for them. It's not worth our time. I'm not even going to be bothering with that one, so. No, it ain't worth our time. And we'll end the episode relatively soon once we get to the next focus, shall we? Shall we? We shall. Only 232 factories. We're going to pump those numbers up. Caulk has been injured. We want to do that one. And then after that, I'll probably read about open the black market, maybe. Yeah. Break open the caches. Nice. Senate election results in. Uh, if you'd like to read about this, just go right ahead. It doesn't really matter too much. So, polls are updated. Operation. Uh, no. Concord? Yes. Jewel? Sure. Sure. Anything else? Political landscape. Working well, working well. Somewhat united. So 27 far-right senators. Four senator MPP. U2 almost shot down over England. Yesterday, German fighters based out of northern England nearly shot down a CIA U2C pilot piloted by Lieutenant Francis Gary Powers. Powers had just entered English airspace when the four Horton Ho 
229 fighter f flying wings were detected on radar. However, three were forced to turn back due to fuel range, one of which crashed in the North Sea when it got overzealous and ran out of fuel for the return trip. The final aircraft managed to get it within the missile range and fired at powers with what appeared to be an experimental missile designed specifically to shoot down U-2 before peeling off to return to the pow to base. Powers evaded the missile and proceeded on course, completing his mission to return to Eisenhower Air Force Base in Iceland. Due to the classified nature of the mission, we cannot let it be known publicly that our aircraft was engaged by German fires. No diplomatic protests will be issued and no German scare will take to the front page of the morning news. Not this time. Good job, Gary. Gary. First fallen domino. And hopefully we'll have another event soon. What do we got here? Anything here? Up here? What do we have? Oh, we can increase unity. Um, I'm, I think we're kind of okay for now. That's a lot of far-right senators, but it makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. No one that I really know around here. See, long. Wait, hold on. Jimmy Davis. Uh, there's no, there's no long down there. That sucks. And then we'll conclude with the reading of one more focus, shall we? Breaking to open the caches. England has no shortage of disillusion, disillusion. It is villains willing to trade their lives for the matrimonious right-wise freedom. Similarly. America has no shortage of guns, pistols, machine guns, factory fresh M14s left over stands from the Second World War, perhaps an armored car, three in a warehouse, and the corresponding ammo. What one may ask will an assemblage of angry men do with weapons brought free of charge from a land which only has too many of too many for itself? The answer might surprise some. After all, free England expects creativity out of every fighting tar. Cool, but that's going to end today's longish, somewhat episode. If you enjoyed it, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow when things are going to fall apart in 1963, and we might just go end up and lose this war against Guyana. Thanks for watching, though, and have a great rest of your day.